thank you, Tom, for the opportunity to speak this evening. It is a privilege to speak to all of you. My topic is about curriculum, so I'd like to start right in with the math problem that I find very interesting. <laughs> this problem is interesting because after you've read the first two words, you pretty much know what the problem is about. And the problem is interesting because a problem like this is in basically every algebra textbook currently. The problem is interesting because it was in every algebra textbook when we were in high school, and for some of us that's a long time ago. But I didn't choose it for any of those reasons. I chose it because it's in this textbook written in 1892, 119 years ago. Interestingly, it was written by Matthew McCurdy from Phillips Academy, Andover. <laughs> Yeah, they're still using that, that's right. <laughs> so the question is, what was the U.S. math curriculum like in 1892? And I'd like to offer three historical documents to give you an idea what that was like. So first, I'd like to show you pages from the McCurdy text. Numerical substitution. Subtraction of polynomials. Multiplication, expanding, squaring, similar, dividing, long division of polynomials, factoring, sum and difference of like powers, reduction to lowest terms, adding and subtracting fractions, multiplying and dividing fractions with polynomials, <coughs> solving equations with fractions, solving literal equations, simultaneous equations, those are linear ones, the binomial theorem, exponents, negative and fractional exponents, radicals, Solving equations with radicals, like number five, a double radical. Solving quadratics where binomials are embedded. Systems of nonlinear equations, here's the conics. Inequalities and systems of inequalities. Variation, indirect, direct variation. Arithmetic series, geometric series, and sequences, permutations and combinations. The word problems are spread throughout the textbooks, but I've gathered them together on the following three screens. They look awfully familiar to me. Upstream, downstream. These two involve geometry. There were lots of problems involving money regularly in those textbooks. This is joint variation here. How many different permutations can be formed from the letters of Mississippi? That's currently in the Earl Swarkowski pre calculus book. Currently. Democrats and Republicans, they didn't get along then. <laughs> so that gives you a glimpse of what the wow. curriculum was like in 1892, but I want to give you a, another perspective because that's just one textbook. The college board started in 1901, and for the first 25 years they offered only achievement tests. The aptitude test started in 1926. It, these are some screenshots from the early tests. There, are three, there were three tests offered, sort of, uh, if you will, level one, level two, and level three. So this will give you an idea. Two hours, just seven questions. Two minus x, x minus two, right? Factoring out the minus one. Systems of nonlinear equations. So that's the easiest of the three tests. This is the second test.
8 to the negative 2 thirds. Here's the third test. There's one question that I find quite interesting. It's they, they did graph equations. Look at this 4a. Plot, plot the equation xy equals 4 and 2x minus 3y equals 5 and on the same axes and from the figure estimate the solutions of the equations. Actually quite a progressive question I think for 1892. For uh, this is actually happens to be 1916. So that gives you an idea, uh, a, a second glimpse of what the curriculum was like that, that, at that time. The third document that I'd like to show coincidentally also comes from 1892, exactly 119 years ago. This is about the first standards movement in the United States. Education in the late 1800s for the most part followed the European model for secondary education. That included that in the 10th grade you would make a choice, uh, that system of education that I'm about to describe is used still for most of the European sy system and actually in most of the world for secondary education. In the 10th grade often there's a choice whether you're going to go more votech or towards university bound. Students study to the 13th grade, not the 12th grade typically. Students often are studying 10, 11, or even 12 subjects at the same time, typically studying biology and chemistry and physics every year, and often studying two different math classes every year, let's say geometry and algebra at the same time. So, in 1892, the National Education Association formed the Committee of Ten, and this is the list of the Committee of Ten. The president was Charles Eliot, who, the, excuse me, chairman was Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard at the time. These ten men, all men, were from universities, presidents of universities, principals of private schools, and only one was a principal of a public school. And so they made the following recommendations. And this is where we mostly deviated and the United States became different than the rest of the world in, way, in some of the, our nuances. That uh, eight years of elementary and then four years of high school. To reduce the number of subjects to just five, less is more. I'm not saying these are good or bad, I'm just saying this is where our ed educational system came from. They said biology in the ninth grade chemistry in the 11th grade, and physics in the 12th grade. That's what they said. And here are some screenshots from the original document. That the study of chemistry should precede that of physics, that the study of physics should be pursued the last year of high school. Right? We have a physics first uh, movement in the United States. It took about 110 years in order to change what the Committee of Ten arbitrarily said at that time. That both physics and chemistry should be required for admission to college. And have you ever wondered why it is that we study algebra in the ninth grade, take a time out, do geometry, and then go back to algebra two? Because 119 years ago, 10 men said that's what we should do. The conference believed that the study of demonstrative geometry should be, come at the end of the first year's study of algebra, and that's why we do this. And that all students should take college prep. So that gives you a glimpse of what the curriculum was like in 1892, and it's strikingly similar in math mathematics to the curriculum that we have today. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's an inappropriate curriculum, but it does mean that it doesn't take into account anything that's happened, or very much at least, in the last 119 years. But a lot, in fact, has happened since the Committee of, uh, Committee of Ten in 1892. For instance, the population has grown from 1.5 million to 7 million. That's had huge implications for us as people. We, since then, we've had mass transportation, mass communication. Medicine is drastically different. In 1951 came the first credit card. The way we purchase is drastically different. In 1955, oil overtook coal as the world's number one energy resource. A drastic change for us. And if you consider them through the last half of the 20th century computers and then culminating in about 1990 with the World Wide Web, drastic changes for us. Going back one year, the standards in 1989, the NCTM standards, I think was an attempt 
to try to say, hey, maybe it's time to make some changes. But if you look at the summary of changes in content and emphasis, you'll see that there are bullet points specifically saying what should happen for algebra, specifically what should happen for geometry, for trigonometry, for functions, and then here at the end, just three words. <laughs> Statistics, probability, and discrete mathematics. And what I'd like to do for most of the rest of the talk is turn this on its head. Before I do that, I'd like to say, so how's it going for us, sticking with this curriculum relatively unchanged for 119 years? First, what I'd like to do is just talk about high school dropouts. In the United States, 25% of teenagers don't graduate from high school. 7,000 students per day drop out of high school. 1.3 million U.S. high school dropouts per year. Dropout factories, sure, we lose some, but who's counting? Well, some people are counting, 1.3 million. The second thing I'd like to look at is what's called math dropouts. I don't think I'm going out on a limb here saying that the traditional curriculum in the United States is, is designed to prepare students to take calculus. Pre-algebra, excuse me, geometry, pre-algebra, algebra one, algebra two, pre-calculus is just really four years of pre-calculus. So I've been interested for quite some while and looked up the numbers to say, well, what percentage of kids uh, take calculus and pass it? So here are the numbers that I came up with. Many of which, of the, many of these numbers, not all came from this article. About 14% of graduating seniors had taken some course called calculus. Now remember that only th three quarters, we're only reaching three quarters because 25% of the population doesn't even graduate from high school. So that's only about 10.6% of high school age students take calculus. Half of them took the AP calculus exam. So half of the 10.6 is about 5.5% of high school age students take an AP exam. Good number, 83% of them earned a three or higher on the AP exam, which most of us would say that's showing success in calculus. So 83% of that 5.5% is 4.6% 4, 4 of high school age students pass calculus. Only 4.6%. Now 6.1% of high school graduates take calculus in college, but 40% fail. So we have 60% of the 6.1 or 3.6% of college students pass calculus, and if you add those numbers together, this from high school and this from college, and actually there's overlap, there's probably, there's a lot of overlap, I couldn't find those numbers, <laughs> then you have approximately 8.2%. 8.2% of the population passes calculus. Our goal in our curriculum is designed to get to prepare kids for calculus and 8.2% of the population at some time in their life passes calculus. Now some of you are saying, Niels, your numbers are off. I saw that one number and I'm not so sure about that, right? Double it. That's fine. <laughs> triple it. It's okay with me. If you triple it and I'm off by that far and I really don't think I am, then even only 25% of the population would pass calculus, and in any kind of grading system, that's failing. So what